During the COVID-19 lockdown, I've been getting to know George Herbert. George Herbert was born in 1593 and died in 1633. And at the age of 39, as George Herbert was on his deathbed, he gave 167 unpublished poems to a friend. And he said these words. If you can think they may turn to the advantage of any dejected poor soul, let them be made public. If not, burn them. George Herbert died in March 1633. But later that year, his poems were published under the title The Temple. The Temple is still in print today, and it established Herbert as one of the greatest religious poets of all time. And over the centuries, many poor, dejected souls, including Charles Spurgeon, Richard Baxter and C.S. Lewis, have testified that Herbert's poems have indeed been to their advantage. Now, I'm not a poetry expert, far from it. I'm not really even a poetry enthusiast. But that's one of the things that makes George Herbert so special that even someone like me can enjoy his poetry. And this August, Sunday evening by Sunday evening, we're going to read and reflect on a George Herbert poem. And the poem for this evening is called The Altar. The Altar is about worship. And the theme of the poem, I think, is that an important part of worship is sorrow. An important part of worship is sorrow for sin and particularly for our own sin. But when people like us feel sorrow for sin, we can come to God and we can commit ourselves to God because there was a sacrifice that was made for people like us. In a moment, the poem will appear on the screen. And if you can see this video as well as hear it, you'll notice that this poem has been shaped. The poem has been shaped to look like an altar. And the poem also has a number of words in capital letters, which is Herbert's way of highlighting them. And so let's read the poem. This is The Altar by George Herbert. A broken altar, Lord, thy servant rears, made of a heart and cemented with tears, whose parts are as thy hand did frame, no workman's tool hath touched the same. A heart alone is such a stone as nothing but thy power doth cut. Wherefore each part of my hard heart meets in this frame to praise thy name. That if I chance to hold my peace, these stones to praise thee may not cease. O oh, let thy blessed sacrifice be mine and sanctify this altar to be thine. Now, it doesn't matter if you don't understand much of that. I don't understand much of it either. And it takes time to understand this sort of rich poetry. But here are a few reflections. A common theme in Herbert's poetry is the human heart, and especially the effect of sin on the human heart. In the Old Testament, altars were cut out of stone, cut by a workman's tool. But here, in lines 5 to 8, Herbert is saying that the human heart is so hard, harder than any stone, that only God himself can cut through it. In line 11, Herbert refers to this frame, which is a reference to the poem itself. In the poem, Herbert is giving God his heart. He's giving God his hard heart and asking that God would cut away at it, chip away at it, slowly but surely, to shape him into the worshipper he wants to be. But then in line 14, Herbert says, Even if my hard heart doesn't praise God, which it doesn't a lot of the time, I want these stones or these words I've written to praise God and to not cease praising God. Then line 15 is really important. In fact, line 15 anticipates another poem which we'll read next Sunday evening. But line 15 points us in the direction of a sacrifice. You see, a broken heart is an important part of worship. But a broken heart isn't what makes a person acceptable to God. To be acceptable to God, a person needs a sacrifice. 
a sacrifice that God himself has made. And we know that sacrifice is his one and only son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ alone is the one who made George Herbert acceptable to God. And the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone is the one who makes people like us acceptable to God too. Well, here's a final reflection. George Herbert didn't write this poem as a new Christian, but as someone who had been a Christian for a long time. Ongoing sorrow for sin was an important part of his worship. But is sorrow for sin an important part of our worship? Is sorrow for sin an important part of our private worship or an important part of our public worship? Or is it absent? I wonder if sorrow for sin is absent a lot of the time from our worship. And the question is, why? Why isn't sorrow for sin an important part of our worship today?